here, Seekers. I'm Nick. Asus sent over one of their top dogs, the ROG Strix RTX 3090 Gaming, for us to check out. So we decided to run it through our regular suite of benchmarks on both Windows and Linux and see how this card stacks up against the other 30 series GPUs we've had through the studio so far. So let's check it out. The last few weeks with these new 30 series NVIDIA GPUs has been pretty up and down and has been plagued with a few issues like supply and demand and now the capacitors on the cars themselves. A lot of people have had issues with stability and we actually found some pretty interesting stuff regarding that and it might change what people perceive to be the actual issue with these cards. Now there's a lot of data to unpack in this video and also remember uh, if you don't want to see a certain part of the video, there's chapters and all you need to do is click on the like progress bar of the video by mousing over it or checking out the timestamps down below in the description so you can see whatever part of the video tickles your fancy. The ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3090 Gaming is built on NVIDIA's new Ampere architecture and features 24 gigs of GDDR6X memory. In terms of power delivery and consumption, it requires three 8-pin PCIe power connectors and will consume on average around 395 watts at full tilt. It also features SLI through NVLink and they've changed the edge connector and that will require you to get a new SLI bridge if you're going to go down that path. But most of the specifications and everything that I'm talking about here can be found on the product page for the GPU and I'll drop that down below in the description if you want to check it out. I wanted to change up our GPU video format so let's get to the benchmarks and the comparisons and let's get that out of the way right at the beginning and then we'll chat about some other stuff that we found with this GPU. Okay with that said let's kick it off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. You can use that magic pause button at any time during this video to take a longer look at the graphs but let's get into it. As we've seen with all of these 30 series GPUs so far, 1080p really isn't their strong point, and the same thing is echoed here with the ASUS RTX 3090 as well. It's completely CPU bound in both Windows and Linux. The 3090 is not designed for 1080p, and it's not even designed for 1440p. And when we compare Windows to Linux, we're seeing that the Linux performance is slightly better than Windows with Vulkan than it is with DX12. And we also see this echoed with the rest of the benches at other resolutions as well. At 1440p, we're seeing the performance being pretty close to 1080p as 1440p also becomes less CPU bound. Again with Linux, it just edges out and comes out on top. At 4K, we're seeing the same thing again with the Vulkan performance being slightly better and trumping DX12. The implementation from Feral is really good here. It's relatively consistent across the board. All right, let's do some superposition testing. We do three tests in total. We use 4K optimized, 1080p extreme, and a custom 1440p preset with motion blur and depth of field disabled. First up with 1080p and the Extreme benchmark, you'll notice that it's highly GPU bound and the ASUS RTX 3090 delivers the best result I've ever seen with any GPU at 1080p Extreme. It beat out the Gigabyte card in this test as well. And in Linux, we're seeing the OpenGL version of the benchmark not perform as well. And we've tested this with other kernels, with other distros and a whole bunch of different combinations. And the reality is they're always just about the same.
We're seeing similar results here with 1440p and 4K, and we're seeing the same difference relatively across the board with both Windows and Linux. Next up is Basemark GPU. Basemark gives us a great indication of Vulkan performance since it's been designed from the ground up to use the Vulkan API at a very low level. So let's see what happened. At 1080p, the ASUS card pulls away from the rest of the GPUs that we've tested by a noticeable amount. This again is echoed in Linux as well. And if we compare Windows and Linux, unlike Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we're seeing Windows actually perform better in Vulkan than with Linux. At 1440p again, the differences are about the same as 1080p, and given what we know about Vulkan and how the API interacts with the hardware, it actually scales quite well and gives us a good indication of what's going on with the differences here between Windows and Linux. And again at 4K, we're seeing basically the same thing here with Windows and Linux and with these comparisons as well. Okay, let's circle back to Shadow of the Tomb Raider and do some other tests like DLSS and ray tracing. Although Tomb Raider only supports DLSS 1.0, we also include Death Stranding because of its DLSS 2.0 support. Now we run a bunch of different combination of tests to see with Ray Trace Shadows enabled, with DLSS enabled, with both enabled at both 1440p and 4K. At 1440p, the results are pretty much as you'd expect. It's really echoing what we saw with the other three tests that we've done so far. Moving on to 4K, we're seeing the 3090 pull ahead of the 3080 and the rest of the field as well. Okay, let's move on to Death Stranding. We decided to do a 2080 Ti versus a 3090 DLSS 2.0 comparison with both of the DLSS modes enabled and completely disabling them at 1440p and 4K at max settings. We also test some professional workloads as well. It's the type of benchmark most people like to overlook, but it's important for people who are buying these GPUs for workstations. We decided to test all of our GPUs with two Blender scenes, both the Classroom and BMW scenes, and Premiere Pro with render times to show you how quick it renders with our test project. First up is Blender with the BMW scene. And remember with the rest of these tests, all of these benchmarks are determined by having a lower score. So lower is better. Finally, onto Adobe Premiere Pro and Adobe Media Encoder. This is an indication of the expected performance. This one is somewhat dependent on the CPU as well, but this will give you an idea of what we saw. The render times were not that different across the board. We also ran our one hour stress test in Furmark and we couldn't get the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 3090 gaming above 63 degrees in our 18 degree climate controlled office. The result is actually fairly impressive, but also be aware this is running on an open air test bench and the results in a closed system will no doubt be very different from what we observed in this video. As far as what the ASUS card offers over this, the founders card, yes, it just arrived as we were starting to record this video. You're getting RGB with the ASUS card, if that's your kind of thing. It's actually got quite a lot of RGB. I actually like the look of the RGB with this GPU. You're getting a pretty silent card with minimal coil wine. You have to remember on an open air system, you're gonna hear absolutely everything. You're getting a card with dual BIOS mode, which can be switched between the OC and silent mode. You're getting a card that doesn't require a new power connector like this thing. I wonder if you can actually see the power connector there. You're also getting a card that features two PWM fan connectors, which allows you to connect some fans of your own directly to your GPU for additional cooling. However, you're getting a card that can suck up to 395 watts of power. And I also saw it spiking up to around 405 watts in some tests, which is pretty insane. Now, I'll drop some more information about this card in the description down below for those who are interested. But yeah, obviously they're not available right now. So I'm not gonna go into pricing because I don't think that's really fair for this video if we like 
talk about pricing and if you can buy it or whatnot because you know the situation right now. Okay, it's time to address the elephant in the room. Now there's been a lot of talk about these new 30 series cards having a lot of instability issues caused by the capacitor types being used. Now, we actually found this uh, pretty interesting and we found some interesting things about this card in particular, and that being the ASUS card. Now this card uses MLCC based capacitors as opposed to the POSCAP ones, which are supposed to be a better solution. Now I've spoken to a few engineer buddies of mine and their response has been basically that it doesn't matter uh, what capacitors they use and regardless of what the internet's saying, there are so many variables and they're focusing on a single type of thing and the issue could be that it's actually pretty hard to determine even though we know what is being put on the card because each batch of production can be different. Now there's so many variables that sometimes identifying something like a capacitor type can be pretty problematic. Now this got me thinking, I saw a bunch of other YouTubers talk about this whole situation and also Igor's lab's findings with the designs of the card and I wondered if there was anything else that could actually be at play here with these GPUs. Don't get me wrong, the findings that Igor had were actually really interesting. They did some really good work at isolating potential issues that people are having, but what if I told you <laughs> I actually found that it could be something else completely that no one else has really covered yet. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because with the ASUS card at 1080p with Shadow of the Tomb Raider in Windows, I had some issues with DirectX and crashing to desktop. Now this only happened at 1080p with the ASUS card at no other resolution did I see it happening and with no other cards that we've had did I see this happening. Now it happened four times in a row and eventually we got some successful benchmark runs in that allowed us to share that data with you in this video. The boost clock I noticed hit 2050 megahertz and sustained that for about 30 seconds and then it crashed out. Now we had the same issue at 4K with base mark and windows and our two initial runs that we did with base mark also failed and dropped us back to the desktop. As far as I know, no one has tested this and this is some really early stuff that I've just been tinkering with, but I ran the same test in Linux with the latest Nvidia drivers with the same GPU with it boosting to a higher 2100 megahertz and we didn't have any instability at all. Not a single driver crash, nothing. No lockups, absolutely nothing. It was it's as stable as you'd expect a brand new GPU to be. Here's what I suspect is happening. I think it's quite possibly a driver issue and not related to power delivery at all. Chances are I'm really wrong about this, but with Linux, I tried to replicate what we saw in Windows and there was just no crashing at all. So yeah, and the reason why I'm saying this is because when I reverted back to the press drivers in Windows, I didn't see any instability issues. I tried to replicate the crashing with, again, with those press drivers and they just wouldn't crash. The second I switched back to the mainline drivers from the Nvidia website, I saw the same crashes again and they crashed back to desktop. So yeah, I, um, it's, it's really odd. It could be the drivers, but I, I just don't know. It's too early to say. And the, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this in this video as well, because I wanted to bring some attention to this. I'm not jumping to any conclusions about anything at all. I just wanted people who have these cards who are versed in Linux to give it a try and see if they can really replicate these issues in Linux. Now, Wendell from Level 1 Techs, if you've got a 30 series GPU, uh, let us know. See if you can like, like try and replicate some crashing. I'd also like to put out the challenge to Jay from Jay's Two Cents and both Steve's from Gamers Nexus and Hardware Unbox. And if you're up for a Linux challenge, I'd love to see what you guys come up with. I'm actually pretty curious to see what we can do as a community and we can come together and see if we can replicate it being isolated to Windows. And I think the more information we have, the better. And I think if it's a driver issue, uh, it'd be good to have the community come together to help identify this without everyone getting their pitchforks out for once. Let's do this together and Let's, let's do what we do best in the tech community. Find a solution to a problem and not dwell on the problem itself. Right, and that's kind of what I wanted to do. I want everyone to come together. I, I really want to see if it's Windows being the problem here because I just could not replicate this in Linux whatsoever. Yeah, and that's basically it. Anyways, guys, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you hated the video, you know what to do, hit that dislike button twice. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy, Nick with Gear Seekers. You peak. We seek, and please guys, if you have a 30 series GPU, and I know not many of you have them, if you are versed in Linux, 
run Shadow of the Tomb Raider, run Base Mark, run Superposition, run any GPU benchmark where you're gonna hit those boost clocks and let us know what you find because I'm very, very curious to see if Windows might actually be the culprit here. Thanks for watching.